So thank you. So our guest uh, speaker this morning for some of us needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, she inspired us, motivated us, supported us, guided us, and loved us from Christmas 2009 until Christmas of 2015 as the senior minister, the spiritual director of our beloved community. But for those of you who have not met her, Reverend Denise Schubert is an ordained minister, ordained through the larger international organiz organization called Centers for Spiritual Living. She has served at uh, the Agape Center for Spiritual Living in Los Angeles, at the North Hollywood uh, Center for Spiritual Living in, of course, North Hollywood, the Bodhi Center for Spiritual Living in Chicago, and um, while retired is certainly uh, not doing nothing, she has a great body of work uh, that you'll be able to hear a little bit about this cell, uh, today. Um, and uh, even during this message and then also this afternoon during her workshop. So please uh, welcome my mentor and our friend, Reverend Denise Schubert. <laughs> I did, I, I got here this morning by 8 o'clock and I had about 20 minutes of awkwardness, like, oh, this feels, it's like, you know, an old pair of shoes, you know, I can, but, but my car remembered how to get here, so I didn't get lost. So it's just, uh, thank you so much for having me, it's so great to see so many of you, new, there are new faces here, and you have, the pl space looks amazing, this is awesome, and the fellowship hall, the ceiling, it's beautiful, it's beautiful, warms my heart. All right, so we have a big conversation to have today. We have a metaphysical conversation to, ha to have with each other today. So uh, <coughs> we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, so my body of work that Dusty was talking to, I really, uh, I call it a life of power. And I wanted to, you know, it really is a life of poise, power, confidence, a life of authenticity, creativity, a life in which you feel like you're in charge of your destiny, a life in which you feel bodacious, extraordinary. Uh, you know, we have a dash, right? You born 1951. We don't, I don't know my end date yet, and don't do the math, but you have a, <laughs> in the middle of all that, there's a dash, right? And that dash, uh, should be something that's meaningful to us personally. It should matter to you what happens during that time. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you are, and I believe you are, if you and I are individualized expressions of life itself, we're like little points of consciousness within a, 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 the one consciousness, then uh, I'm pretty sure that we were created to be here in joy and happiness and contribution and service. So... Uh, power, I looked up this word power, and what it means is the capacity to act or to do things effectively. And then I was led to look up effective because the power to act to do things effectively all by itself would be great, right? Wouldn't it be great to feel effective in life, like you could get s uh, stuff done? You know, like uh, I've been a science online minister for a really long time and worked with a lot of people, and there is, uh, there's the desires of our hearts and our longings, and then there's the demonstration or manifestation of those desires and longings, and it seems like getting from there to there is pretty hard for most people. Like there's a gap. Like how do you manifest your deepest desires and longings? And I think that has to do with effectiveness. So effective means to be successful in producing a desired or intended result. So life of power means to live a life where you are um, architecting a life of your making and not being whipped around by the circumstances in your life. Are you with me? Yeah. 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 So <clears throat> the human race in general is not living necessarily in a powerful space and time. You know, the fear, hunger, poverty, war, disenfranchisement, all of that is still really the predominant experience of the race, <coughs> the human race. And uh, 
in order for that to change, something has to change in us individually. Why? Because, well, I'm a metaphysician. As are you. If you're here, you are also a metaphysician. And what that means is that we, uh, we practice knowing and practice living this idea that there's something beyond the physical that we're just not being bounced around here by circumstances or conditions. Now, the easiest way I can think of to say this is this, that the spiritual universe is a universe about ideas. The spiritual universe is a universe of thought, of mind, of ideas. <clears throat> the physical universe is a universe of things and effects and forms. So the spiritual universe gives rise to or produces that which is visible. God bless you. So if that's true, then the place where you and I need to work is on that which is not visible. We need to work and abide in the idea of ideas. Now, the topic I chose today is unconditional happiness. And I, it was instigated in me by reading a book by Michael Singer called uh, The Untethered Soul. And I remember reading this ch chapter going, wow, that is such a radical idea to think that we could, you and I can commit to unconditional happiness no matter what's happening around us. No matter what's happening in politics, no, what's happen no matter what's happening in our marriage, no matter what's happening with our families, it's, it's, it, does it feel radical to you to actually commit to unconditionally what that would feel like? Now, <clears throat> I think we need to look at unconditional. So, because unconditional is unconditional, <laughs> right? So not subject to any conditions. And by the way, I, I'm not too invested in the happiness part. I'm mostly invested in the unconditional part because happiness, you can replace that word with peace. You can replace that word, sorry, a little fuzz or something. Hi, Facebook people. Which <laughs> 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 is probably more likely cat hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but peace, uh, it could be peace, it could be happiness, it could be love. Like, you know, we say all the time that love... Uh, do you know how awesome a feeling it is to get that it, within our positive and affirmative theology and philosophy that you and I are unconditionally loved by life? I mean, unconditionally, no conditions. You know, that's a kind of a science of mind 101, but no conditions. It's not only, you know, God doesn't just like some people. God likes everybody mm -hmm. equally. So I'm really might, uh, quite more interested in the word unconditional than I am happiness. But unconditional means unqualified, wholehearted, unlimited, unrestricted, unmitigated, full, total, entire, complete, absolute, and unequivocal, no matter what. So <clears throat> my, I, I, found, I found my own unconditional gene uh, when I was 33. I think I decided it was 33 when I got recruited by an organization called the Hunger Project to run a marathon to raise <coughs> money for ending hunger on this planet. And I really wasn't too invested in ending hunger on this, the planet. That wasn't really, I don't know why I wasn't then, because I was young. I don't know why. <laughs> but nonetheless, I found this group of people. They enrolled me to run. And I was 40 pounds heavier, smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, and had never run a day in my life. And for those of you who don't know, a marathon is 26.2 miles. <laughs> and I had lots of reasons those first two weeks to, uh, to not do that, right? If, in case, uh, if, well, uh, just in case, you know, when you get out, you can only run half a block without pain. You know, and then the next day was half a, a whole block without pain. But I did run the marathon after one year took me one year to, to train and to run. And I had help because left to my own devices, I probably would have wimped out, but I was surrounded by a group of people who helped support me and actually rising to that occasion and completing that. But what got activated in there was, this, was, the, was the awareness that uh, if you really want to accomplish something great in life, 
there are, are actions you have to take that fall under the heading of unconditional, right? Like it's, uh, you don't have an option of going, oh, I, no, I just don't really feel like running today. I don't feel like training. I think I'll eat bonbons and watch TV instead. In order to run 26.2 miles at a certain time, you've, you have no choice but to put your shoes on and that your feelings in that choice are irrelevant. And we, but you and I believe that our feelings are relevant. Now, I'm not saying don't have them, and I'm not saying lie about them, but anybody who's up to anything in life knows that their fe your feelings are to be held lightly because they don't necessarily dictate that you should do anything. Does it make sense? Yeah. It does to that person. <laughs> <clears throat> if I am going to go climb Mount Everest, I do not want my partner to be at the effect of their feelings when they wake up that morning. Right? I want somebody who's committed, unequivocally committed, to being present in the moment because my life will depend on it. And they want that from me as well. So the only place where uh, conditional commitment matters is not any place where you and I are supposed to be playing because we're supposed to, we are here uh, trying to find a way to have our dash have some purpose and some meaning and some long lasting legacy after we're gone. And that will take unconditional commitment to anything. Now, <clears throat> I also discovered that self-respect and self-esteem are raised by having uh, your foot on the pedal, right? That accomplishing something that you didn't think you could accomplish, surviving something you didn't think you could survive, calling for something you didn't think you could call forth makes us great. And having that experience of great makes way for more great. So this idea of I can be counted on, I can be counted on to bring forth peace no matter what's happening around me. Unconditionally, I will be a place of peace is an amazingly powerful idea. And remember, metaphysically, the idea is the only thing that matters. Ideas create forms. So your stand for peace will create peace in your life and other people's lives and in, on the planet in general. Now, notice when, all right, so here's a little secret. In, uh, as metaphysicians, reality gets created at a very particular place. And it's that place right now when I say, can you, uh, can you bring forth an unconditional commitment to happiness? Right there, you have a thought right there. And that thought could be, oh yeah, right, really, really, Denise, come on, give me a break. That thought could be, well, I'd love to try. That thought could be, yes, that thought could be, uh, no, unhappiness is inevitable. Everybody has unhappiness. But I want you to know that the reality that gets created is getting created by that, jun that junction of the idea and your thought. That was pretty deep, wasn't it? <laughs> but you're still here, right? Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes, and you, those of you who have been around have quoted this many, many times, that pos it's by Steve Zaffron in a book called Conversations That Matter. He says, possibility is not real at its origin, which is exactly what we're talking about. This idea, these ide you know, when J JFK said, let's put a man on the moon, there was no man and there was no s rocket, there was no fuel, there was nothing. There was no, it didn't exist, what was, what was needed did not exist to put a man on the moon. But his saying it, his, his unconditional commitment to the idea caused the outer manifestation and fulfillment of the idea that was represented. So possibil possibility is not real at its origin. It's something we create as real and then stand for as a reality. 
So I know that you guys are all different, but a happy life is possible. For some of you to say a happy life is possible may feel like an impossibility. You may be trying to send yourself to the moon, right? Or uh, some of you, uh, the idea of a free life or a peaceful life or a life of contribution or a life of service or a life of health may feel like science fiction because you're going to be creating something out of nothing. Possibility is not real uh, at its origin. Now, <clears throat> one of my, this is also, so uh, Jesus, our big brother and our master metaphysician, by the way, master metaphysician, this guy could create out of ideas, right? God created out of ideas too, by the way. H how did the world get created? God thought things, right? God thought things. God thinks and the world gets created and because you and I, are made in the image and likeness of that originating vital energy. Unlike a rock, a rock is also divine, but a rock doesn't think. Well, as far as I know, somebody's going to argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> For today's purposes, rocks do not think. <laughs> that you <laughs> I was going to say cats, but then I knew. I can think of three people in the room and say, cats think. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you and I are, we inherited the ability to create exactly as God creates. God peopled the universe with its word. And you and I people our universe with our word, with our thoughts, with our ideas. Literally all of it. Every circumstance in your life, every condition, everything you own, everything you, all of it that has been created through this idea of, th through ideas, big ideas. Now, happiness for most people is not unconditional. Can you see that? It's just not unconditional. You know, when Singer in his book, he says, D do you want to be happy or don't you want to be happy? And people say, well, of course I want to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. But what people mostly mean is, well, I want to be happy as long as I don't lose my job, right? Or I don't want to be happy, uh, no, I'll be happy unless the uh, election this year doesn't go my way. Or I'll be happy if I lose those three pounds. So th that's called conditional happiness. And everyone does it. So don't, you have to feel bad. Everyone does it. But what does it cost you? It costs you. Nobody shouted it out, so I guess I just have to go. <laughs> so it costs you. So if that were true, it, if that's true, and it is true, for, mo for most of the world it is true, that the world thinks that the manifested universe is real and the realm of ideas is not. And so most of us are down here being battered about by circumstances, right? And it would render us powerless and victims and at the effect of circumstances, at the effect of chairs, at the effect of old ideas. That would be great, except it's not who we are, right? We want to have a life of power, a life of poise and confidence, a life of contribution and meaning, a life where we feel like we matter, a life where we feel like we have some power and control over de not only our own destiny, but destiny in general. I got a sidetracked there, but so J Jesus said, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That message is, don't try to conform to the craziness out here. Don't try to fit in. Th your song had something like regret through habit and regret, right? The world, we need to let the manifested world, the forms and things, just be where they are because they're temporary. When consciousness changes, they'll change. And where consciousness changes is within you. So we have to renew our minds. Ernest Holmes says the fundamental mm -hmm. new thought philosophy is think a new thought. Change your thinking, change your life. But I found this one. It was the Aramaic translation of this, which is do not imitate this world, but be transformed by the renovation of your mind. Mm -hmm. I love that. So the, the image I have about that is, you know, like if you go by an old house or in your house there's this old room, and you think that you can change the whole 
feeling tone of the room by putting a new couch in it. Yeah. It's like sometimes a new couch is not enough to change the f basic unworkability of this ugly old room. So sometimes you have to renovate the room. And I think for most of us, we have to renovate our minds. It's not a, it's not a let's, go buy a piece, let's go buy a new piece of furniture. It's like we have to really undo all of the stinking thinking we've got. Now, Singer asks, <clears throat> do you want to be happy from this point forward for the rest of your life regardless of your past? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was two. <laughs> that was two. <laughs> yeah. So... <clears throat> The path to happiness or the path to peace, the path to power must start for everyone, not just some, for everyone, uh, in coming to terms with and settling up with our past. It just has to be that way because our pasts are full of uh, our past, the, everything that's happened in the past with your families, with your parents, with your childhood, uh, with whatever your circumstances and conditions were, and uh, nine out of ten human beings had, uh, if you were to ask them about their past, it wasn't perfect. They were raised by less than perfect parents. They had less than perfect circumstances. For some of us, myself included, my, my childhood was brutal, right? It was not an easy childhood. I was not around easy people. Uh, but there's something, uh, and up until my 40s, I was run by that past. My self-esteem was governed by that past. My, how, what I thought I was worth was governed by the, what they said in the, in the past, said or didn't say. The self-esteem issues, the uh, uh, habit issues. But at some point when we get complete, that's a non-issue. Like I can now talk about anything from my past, anything, and there is no emotional kickback. And you may not be there yet, but it is possible, and it's uh, an essential step on your journey. So do we want to be happy from this point forward for the rest of your life, regardless of what happened in the past? The yes, because yes. the past, you know, B Byron Katie wrote uh, Loving What Is, and she would say, stop arguing with reality. Now, I would say stop arguing with the illusion, but nonetheless, uh, your past was your past, it's over, it's done. It wasn't what you thought it was anyway. What it was was an interpretation that you as a very young person made and what all of it meant. So a more empowering, another really great context you could create is uh, everything from my past has served to bring me to this moment. Everything in my life has happened for me and not to me. That is a functional context, functional idea that will so empower you. Right? Because it removes from you your, the idea of powerlessness. And as spiritual beings made in the image and likeness of the same thing that created universes, you are anything but powerless. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> again, be noticing as I'm talking what you're saying to what I'm saying. Because to what you're saying to what I'm saying is where your reality gets created. Right there. It's, it's right there. And some of you are not in a happy place right now. I know that. Some of you are, can, walked in the room with very difficult situations going on. But the question is, can, this, can it, there is something within us that is indestructible, unharmable, that transcends the circumstances. You, we are the creators of circumstances. Now, spiritual beings, uh, spiritual uh, people on the path of awakening, enlightenment, uh, whatever you want to call it, transcendence. Uh, it, if you're anywhere along the path, uh, the past is has been neutralized to to some degree. Like it's just more neutral. But all of us, we still worry about the future. Spiritual, highly evolved people like you, we still worry about the future. What does that look like? It looks like, well, Singer asked the question, do you want to be happy from this point forward for the rest of your life regardless of what happens next? Because you and I 
want to control the future, right? We want it to look a certain way. We want to have a certain outcome. We want to, uh, you know, it'd be really great if we were the only consciousness. So manifestation would, be, by the way, be very easy if it were just you and me, or just me. Forget about you, just me, <laughs> right? If it were just me. But the problem is, is that I don't control you. I don't control the world. I don't control what everybody thinks. I don't control all, the whole world of ideas. I only control my world of ideas. So if my happiness is dependent upon uh, going to Africa again, or losing five pounds, or uh, publishing my book, if my happiness is dependent upon that, it has a different quality and different energy than if my happiness is independent of those things. Can you see? Yeah. And same with peace. You know what? You're only going to have peace if, if, if every child on the face of the earth gets fed tomorrow. Do we want every child on the face of the earth to get fed tomorrow? Yeah. Of course. But is your peace dependent on it? Because if it is, you're going to be miserable. And if, it, and if you're miserable, the chances of the children being fed tomorrow lessen. Abraham said, with your, with your joy, you offer to the world joy. With your pain, you offer to the world your pain. So who you and I are, are little spots of consciousness, powerful creators of effects and forms. And we, can tr and we obviously do participate with everyone else. We obviously participate with the rest of the world. <clears throat> so, if you commit to this path, if you commit to the path of unconditional happiness, it will become your spiritual path to transcendence and enlightenment. If you commit to the path of unconditional peace, if you con commit to the path of unconditional kindness, and I'm hoping you're getting that it's not as easy as it sounds, right? The words are rolling off my lips, unconditional happiness. But if you will find in your life a space for that kind of no matter what, you can count on me no matter what to hold a space of peace in my world. What will that mean on the 440 Monday morning? <laughs> what will that mean uh, on the phone with Time Warner? <laughs> Spectrum, sorry. <laughs> right? What will that mean uh, the next time somebody says no to you? I mean, how will that show up in your everyday life? You know, if you're coming to the workshop, we'll play this out a little bit more and talk about the work really is passion, uh, uh, passion, commitment, congruence. So I really don't want to go into the congruence piece of it too much. But what I do know is that your commitment is like a, a light, um, what do they call it? Uh, uh, no, no, for boats, ships. Uh, the lighthouse, like the, the beacon, right? The light, the be beacon mm -hmm. that um, will um, help you find your way back into your commitment every single time. Because then, you know, always in life, you're at a crossroads like this. This is your crossroads. Here you are, right here. And in fact, a friend of mine, uh, Edward, Reverend Edward Bill Hewn in Santa Rosa used to say, do you want an advanced class in metaphysics? Just walk out your front door. Right? Just walk out your front door. So there you are walking out your front door and life happens. And you're walking, walking, walking and at any moment you can take this path towards life affirming in alignment with your deepest commitments and longings, uh, congruent with the things you say you're about or you can go this way which is life denying in, uh, in opposition to what you say you're about, out of alignment with what you, who you say you are. This way is, will cause you heartache. Just because it will. You know, you, uh, I read sometime, sometimes once that um, 
<clears throat> purity of intent. It's like, whoa, <laughs> purity, of, don't close your eyes up here. Purity of intention is like a bucket of white paint. And that when you uh, break an agreement with yourself, even though it may just be a drop of red paint and the white paint and nobody else will notice, you will. Because even though you can't see it, that white paint is tainted with a little bit of pink. So ultimately, this is not about being a good person or a smart person. It's simply about uh, creating for yourself a life of power. And I believe that the lodestone of that life is unconditional commitment to whatever you say is important to you. And then he says, even if you are not interested in transcendence or enlightenment, that living your life uh, from an, the big idea of unconditional happiness will make that dash a whole lot more fun. So ends today's lesson. <laughs> yeah. So Cindy's going to hum while I pray. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so I'm just going to pray. Now, remember, we don't pray. Uh, pray is actually almost even not the right word. We use the word because everyone knows what prayer is. But prayer is, we're not begging or beseeching a reluctant power or deity to give us anything, to change our hearts, to change our minds, to bless us, to have mercy. We're, we pray to simply align ourselves with that which is always taking place. We pray in order to have a shift in our conscious awareness to um, affect this realm of ideas, this realm of the spiritual universe that is a universe of ideas. And so I just invite you to close your outer eyes for a moment, which is to simply uh, let your attention move away from the world of effects. The forms, the conditions, the situations, the circumstances, the people, everything that's already been created, to bless it right where it is, but to simply, through the closing of our outer eyes, we open up our inner, inner eyes, and we open up our inner eyes, moving into that space and place and dimension within us that is the spiritual realm of thought, of ideas, of possibility, of creation. To know that in that space and place, we are unlimited. In that space and place, we are powerful. And in that space and place, we are healed, that our wounds are bathed, that we are comforted. And so what I also know is that we are supported by a universe that regards us unconditionally, that we are loved unconditionally, we are held in high regard. There is nothing held against us from our past. There is nothing preordained for our future, that we are in a cooperative, co-creative, benevolent relationship with our higher self, that self of us that is the very presence of God within us. And so it is from this place knowing that my word, my word is a creative act for and about you and everybody within the sound of my voice that I uh, proclaim and accept out of nothing that your life from this day forward will be different. It will be more poised, more confident, more powerful, that you will, that there will be peace with the past. There will be a surrender and faith and trust in the future. And that our job every day is to make sure that we are in harmony with the deepest passions and desires of our hearts. And so I am grateful in this moment to uh, speak this word. I'm grateful in this moment to accept all of them for myself as well, to, uh, to lay down at the, at, at the altar any idea of puny, any idea of not enough, any idea of small, any idea of at the effect of, and to know that we can choose to bring peace, happiness, love, compassion to any and every situation in our lives. And in doing so, we'll alter the course of history. And so I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful to this in every possible way from the bottom of my heart. I let this be. I release this word into this magnificent, pliable, plastic universe that just molds it, just clothes it with flesh and invite you to accept unconditional happiness and whatever else you want in your life by saying yes, yes. yes. and so it is. So it is.
Thank you. Thank you.